I'm Morgan Smith. Welcome to Worth Point Trending, a panel discussion on safety and opportunity investing in the COVID-19 era. With our special guest, Apollo Lupescu, PhD and Vice President at Dimensional Fund Advisors. A disclaimer, investors cannot invest directly in indexes and they do not reflect fees or expenses of investments. Historical performance is not a guarantee of future results. WorthPoint is a fee-only registered investment advisor serving families and business owners across the United States. With financial planning and wealth management, all of our advisors are designated as certified financial planning professionals and are also partners of the firm. So we are committed to taking the journey with our clients. Through conversations with our clients and partners and given the current uncertainties associated with the COVID-19 crisis, we will continue to find ways to provide useful insights with thought leaders to help us all better navigate the coming weeks, months, and years ahead. This is part two, conversations on safety and investing in the COVID-19 era. And our special guest, Apollo Dupesco, he's responsible for communicating Dimensional Fund Advisors' academic foundations and investment beliefs. He presents an alternative to tr the traditional Wall Street approach. Apollo frequently speaks at various industry conferences across the country, as well as advisor client events. Prior to joining Dimensional, Apollo served in a variety of roles with the U.S. Department of State, from which he formed his own consulting firm, Apollo Consulting Group. His, interest, his interests in finance and investments led him to teaching engagements at the University of California, Santa Barbara. Apollo received his PhD in economics and finance from UCSB and a BA from Michigan State University, where he competed in and coached water polo. So now we're going to move to safety, our, our second subject area. And let's discuss some issues as they relate to safety. In January of 27, uh, there is a really good paper that I read. Dr. Wei Dai published a research brief that stated, among other things, that broad diversification combined with long-term investing is critical to improving the reliability of investment outcomes. Uh, she goes on to say that the portfolio should be as broadly diversified as possible while staying consistent with efficiently pursuing the goal of the portfolio. So this was an aha moment for me when I read that brief, this idea of reliability of outcomes. And I think it relates to what you were saying earlier. You know, it's, it's this idea of statistical probabilities. I think many investors understand diversification as a strategy to help with volatility, but they haven't thought about it from a perspective of reliability of outcomes. Many investors might say they, they are diversified, but they really don't have an idea to what extent they're diversified. Yeah. What are your thoughts on, on this, especially during times of volatility and uncertainty uh, like we're seeing today? Yeah, that's that was a, that was actually a, a great paper, and um, and and the it's it's really um, insightful what what he was looking what he was what he was saying is that that what you want is is not I mean in a very simple term you don't want to go from point A to point B in your financial life irrespective of risk you want to find a way that you're not on the Goliath <laughs> or Superman at Six Flags, which are roller coaster rides that I went with my daughter a year ago for her birthday. You want to find something that gets you to the same place, maybe more like a Legoland <laughs> that's a little smoother. So uh, the more you can uh, diversify, and I'll touch on maybe the, the, the biggest ones that you can diversify, I think the more you can smooth out this ride and, and, and the reliability, how, how likely it is that, that, you, that you get an outcome. So what are the different levels of, of diversification that, 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 you can, um, that you can hit? Well, um, it, it really, to me, it starts with uh, probably the fundamental key decision in, in, uh, in investing, which has to do with, uh, it, it has to do with um, investing in owning companies, which is, as I said, is a stock market. And if you look historically, uh, it has grown in about 9, 10% per year. But this is the uh, basically the the roller coaster. This is the big one. It's this is the uh, the, the ones at Six Flags that, that just make your stomach turn. Um, but it has been a very rewarding ride. I mean, the price of admission is this choppiness. Uh, what you're seeing here is that even though that's the average from year to year, these returns can be all over the place. Uh, so don't expect an average every year. No, in fact, rarely do you see the average. It's quite often ups and downs relative to the average. Uh, 
but as I mentioned earlier from the Matrix book, uh, it has been a rewarding ride because you do grow your money quite significantly. Now, to diversify, one thing you can do is put some money in small companies, put some money in, 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 in value stocks, and that's a way to diversify away from the S&P 500, which is kind of what I'm showing here. The other way to diversify, which is incredibly uh, uh, important, is to not only buy ownership in companies because the fluctuating profits make the market fluctuate, uh, but you can lend your money to corporations and governments uh, and, and the contract specifies an interest rate that you get and at the end you receive your principal back and those are bonds. And if you were to deal with you know, high quality issuers and let's say the US government, uh, which in it, in its entire history, it's an entire history, it has never missed an interest payment or a principal repayment. So when you look at that, and let's say I'm gonna give the US government my money, 30 days later, I get it back plus interest, those are called the 30 day treasury bills, uh, it's a lot smoother ride. I mean, historically, when you look in the data, there's not a single calendar year when you would have seen a negative return. Uh, so it's a way to smooth out the ride by diversifying and, and, um, and, and not necessarily putting all your money into the, the, the stock market. But it comes at the, at the cost of it returns. You don't earn 3 to uh, 9, 10%. You earn something in the order of 3 to 4%. The good news is that, that you hit the bogey, which is inflation. Inflation is the one thing that, that is, is, is hugely important to consider because if you just put the money in cash, uh, you're going to lose value as, as inflation hits. Uh, so this one at least has earned a little bit above inflation. Now, just to see the trade-off, because it is a significant trade-off, the same dollar invested over the same time period in the safety of these 30-day U.S. Treasury bills uh, over the same time frame, no difference um, in terms of the, 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 the time frame, would have grown instead of 7000 to a whopping $21. So it's a very big difference, and that's that's the, that's that's why um, I think it is so important for everybody uh, to have an advisor to sit down with Morgan and the team, and and figure out what is the right balance for my situation. You know, when do I need the money? How much money do I need? Uh, do I have a pension or not? Am I a business owner? What's my risk capacity? All these are hugely important considerations, along with many others, and then ultimately they go into building a financial plan that takes account of all these personal circumstances and based only on that financial plan, then an advisor can recommend, okay, for your situation, this should be the right balance between stocks and bonds. Um, and, and, and everybody might, 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 might have a different mix depending on your own situation. Uh, so to me, uh, that is the most important uh, decision in investing is, is just sitting down on an advisor, coming up with a financial plan and, 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 and figure out how much do I want to put into the, uh, the stock market versus bonds? Uh, how much do you want to preserve capital versus grow it? And because these are very big uh, differences in terms of what investors uh, receive. So that's the first way to achieve what uh, Dr. Wei was, was talking about in her paper. Uh, the second way is to realize that the US is not the only place to invest. And in fact, one of the things that you can do is draw a map where instead of landmass, you plot the value of all companies that you can buy and sell around the world. And what you see is that in the US, when you add up Apple, McDonald's, Google, Wells Fargo, all the companies we all love, there are about 3,000 of them in the, in the US. Uh, and when you look at these 3,000 companies, they amount to about 54% of the value of all companies uh, around the world in which you can buy ownership, which means there are you know, about 9,000 plus other companies in 40 different countries uh, that you can also uh, consider as an opportunity to invest. And what's been interesting is there are decades when the US market is doing really well, and there are decades when international stocks are doing well. And that seesaw in a way is a way, is, is a way to increase the reliability of, 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 uh, of outcomes because you know if they move in seesaw then then that's what's negative that's usually considered to be what's negative correlation meaning that uh, they don't move in lockstep in the same direction but rather in opposite direction and they balance uh, each other out and that's that's actually a good thing for a uh, a portfolio you and know the third I, yes I'm, i love that that chart that you just showed because a lot of people a lot of clients come to me and say well how do you build portfolios and 
why wouldn't you want more in this country or less in, in some other country? And, and oftentimes they're looking at GDP, but what this chart actually does is it breaks down countries uh, by, by market capitalization, which is different. And um, so, so what you're saying is don't just kind of buy at home with those companies that you know, you're missing out on a lot of, of opportunities and that could affect you uh, when it comes to reliability of outcomes and diversification. Absolutely. And, 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 you know, you have these 3000 companies among the large and the small, but, mm -hmm. uh, but think about this. I mean, in, in the U S we have right here in the Midwest, we have a GM and a Ford, and those are companies that we should, you know, absolutely worth consider buying. Uh, and then you have in Germany, you might have a BMW and in, in Japan, you might have a Toyota. Uh, all I'm saying is that they're worth considering. Why not? You have an Apple here in, in Northern California, uh, but you also have a, a, a Samsung in, in, in Korea. Uh, so there are opportunities everywhere. It, you know, 7-Eleven, I just, I just heard a, um, an ad for them and it just kind of like I said, we've been around for a long time serving communities. Absolutely true. It just turns out that right now they're owned by a company in Japan. So that's, that's, the, that's the idea is that you want to participate uh, globally and it go a little bit beyond what you're comfortable with your back of the woods companies and then the state, uh, the companies in your state or maybe in the U.S. And the more diversified global uh, perspective you have, the more you can uh, do exactly what you mentioned, increase the reliability as long as things are moving lockstep. If they look moving lockstep, then probably they won't. But as long as they don't, which it's, that's what we see, uh, then there is a benefit to uh, global diversification. Good. I'll, I'll let you move forward. But one, one point that I was always surprised when I saw that uh, oftentimes there were moments in the media where they said, you know, China is going to take over the world. And you look at that, it was only represented about 6% of the, the, global, the global market cap, which is pretty, pretty enlightening. Yeah, because quite a lot of the Chinese companies are either not available for ownership by foreigners or uh, they're government owned uh, or, uh, you know, just uh, uh, they're, they're, they're not, you know, when you look at a U.S. investor, what that 6% represents the opportunity that exists for you rather than, than the economy. Uh, I mean, it, I'm not a, a, a great scholar of the Chinese economy, but just anecdotally, it does seem like the state and the government controls quite a bit of it. Uh, and uh, and why they have free markets, I, I just don't know to what degree all these are open and, and even transparent enough to pass the mustard of, of Western standards <laughs> for disclosures and accounting. <laughs> um, so that's the, yeah, that, <laughs> that's for another. Very good. Um, so continuing on this theme of safety, uh, recently, uh, some of the media are laying out the case that many smaller companies with limited resources will not survive the COVID-19 crisis. And so we should make a point of focusing on investing in those large companies with deep pockets that will survive the crisis. And, you know, the implication is that we don't want all those smaller companies that we're going to, that are not going to survive this crisis in our portfolio. And maybe um, utilizing index funds isn't the best way to in, be investing at this, at this time. Uh, is this true? Can we do anything to address this? And can you provide yeah. some insight into this, this notion? Yeah, so it's, uh, it's, 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 a, it's obviously it's intuitive. I mean, it's, it absolutely. is, it's, it, it does seem like, well, these companies are certainly not as well, uh, you know, and, and, and you hear on the paper in the paper though, is, is just, even as you read today that, that, you know, a lot of large companies as well are, are in trouble. It's not just small companies all of a sudden they are, um, I think that 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 when we looked at the the, the issue, it and you know, first of all, the companies who are in a pretty precarious position, uh, they have already been hammered by uh, by by the by the market in terms of the price that you see. Uh, so you kind of say, well, maybe I should go pick some stocks. Um, I don't think that's the right that's the right way to do it because um, because these these companies have already been. Uh, been punished by by the price dropping. Uh, and the, on the other hand, you don't know <laughs> uh, which ones these companies will make it through and, and how. And, and in fact, probably the way to get hurt is to concentrate uh, into a, a handful of stocks you think are better than others. But we have looked at this issue of what happens to small companies when you do hit, uh, hit turbulent times and how many of them 
uh, actually go under. Uh, so what you see is that, that when, you, when you have uh, a historical data set, uh, and the question that he's asking is, um, do small companies go underwater and, and the way the technical term is called delisting. Uh, and delisting just simply reflects they're not listed on the stock exchange either because they went bankrupt, something went wrong, they were too, uh, the price went too low, whatever it is. Uh, and that's, that, that kind of gives you a sign of, of, of what, what's going on um, with small companies. And what I can tell you, in the small companies, uh, the historical average, the historical average in terms of percentage of small companies being delisted is about 2.7%. That's over the long run. That's what you see. On an average per year, 2.7% uh, of these companies that are small, they don't make it. So if you put in perspective, if you have, um, if you have 2,000 small companies in the U.S., uh, and then about 2.7% of them don't make it, it's roughly 50 or 60 companies uh, or so in the neighborhood that, that, that don't make it um, in a particular year. And that hey, can is- we, Can on, we pause on, for, for a second? Uh, just to clarify, you're defining small companies as the, 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 the lowest 10th percentile or 6th percentile? What, what I, is I, appreciate you, I appreciate you kind of bring that up so I, because I'm, I'm kind of <laughs> being presumptuous here. So if no, you bring up the, the, small, the, 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 uh, the market, uh, there are different ways in which investors define what is large cap and what is small cap. And um, one of the definitions that is out there in the industry is you take the, the first thousand companies in terms of their size and size is the price per share multiplied with the number of shares outstanding. And that's called market capitalization. How valuable is the company? Um, and you take the thousand largest and that becomes large. And then the next 2000, they become small. That's one way we do it. That's one way to do it. Uh, the other one is to consider instead of that is that, that the, the companies that when you start adding them from the bottom account for the bottom 10% of all the, the stocks in the market. So when you add up their value together amounts to 10% of the value, then you say, well, the, the largest of these becomes the, the, the largest in the small cap universe and then everything else beyond it is large. So that leaves that 90% of the value of companies are in uh, large. The two definitions are not vastly different. They're, they're roughly similar. It, what matters is implementation. That's the reason. But what do you think of the bottom 2000 companies or the bottom 10%? It's roughly the same uh, in terms of uh, coverage. Um, that's what small companies are. And uh, um, so when you look at these smaller companies and it's capitalization of about three, $5 billion. So they're not tiny companies. Um, that's the largest in that universe. You see that about 2.7% on average, any given year, uh, they, they go under. Uh, and as a, as a reference point for large companies, it's about, I think, 0.4%. So mm -hmm. it's certainly, uh, you know, uh, more for small companies than it is for large. Now, what's interesting is that that, that is the historical average. Um, when you look in periods when the economy is hitting a rough patch and we had something in 73, 74, and we had some in, in, the, uh, in, the, uh, in the early 90s, we had obviously the, the tech crunch and then the great financial crisis. What you see is that, that there is a spike in, in the rate at which these small companies get delisted. Uh, and historically, the the worst that we've seen, uh, I think, is in the neighborhood in any given year of about six, seven percent. I don't remember seeing an eight percent, but let's say it's six, seven percent of these companies, which means that out of 2000 companies, you might have uh, something in the order of you have 150 companies. So let's say 200 companies out of 2000 that, that, that are going under. But the vast majority of them, they're going through even. And these are the extremes, by the way. These are the absolute extremes that we see. Um, you know, it's not that the majority of them are going under, a subset is going under and that's, that's fine. And so will a subset in large companies, because my guess is that, uh, is, is that when you plot the same thing, you will find that small companies also uh, might go under at a, um, at a higher rate. So that, that is the, um, that's sort of like the way that I, uh, that I think about it is that yes, there will be small companies that will go under without a doubt. But the beauty of being diversified uh, through these dimensional funds is that that you you try you, we're trying to get coverage and we're looking to, uh, to get uh, uh, exposure to the entire asset class. Uh, so you have pretty much all the companies in that asset class on a consistent basis, and even them uh, some might not 
go through, the majority uh, do, uh, uh, do emerge uh, uh, after this storm. This is almost, ways. and this is almost really a great data point showing that, look, there, there is in fact more risk in small companies, thus the more yeah. risk, the more future potential <laughs> returns, right? <laughs> Exactly right. And that's exactly why I expect to get paid more, I have a higher expect return in, in small than in large, because there are periods like this one in, in a downturn, these small companies don't do as well. I think there are different ways also to think about it is that, that you know, if, if I'm telling you that there's a 7%, 7% um, death rate, well, that sounds different than 93% survivor rate. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> So it's basically that's it's the flip side of the same coin. It's it's just that it sounds worse when you say companies are going under versus like hey, ninety three percent of the companies are continue to chug along and, and be just fine afterwards. <laughs> great. Well, that's a great data set. I really appreciate that. I had not seen seen these particular numbers, and I, I just I guess it goes to the point of emphasizing the returns that people see that the markets have produced includes all of the good companies and all of the bad companies. Right. And just focus on that. And um, we have no evidence to show that that uh, index funds aren't 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 doing their job uh, in in times of crisis. I would actually argue it's exactly the opposite. Okay. There's a paper that's one of my favorite papers. Uh, it's called Migration, and and anybody can uh, Google it. It's it's written by uh, Professor uh, Eugene Fama, Chicago, and Ken French at. Uh, at Dartmouth, and what that paper did, which is an academic paper published a while ago, um, it's a fantastic paper because it looks and says, you know, we see there's a premium between small companies and large. Well, what are the actual companies that, that generate this premium? Can we can we get a sense of what what these are? And if I remember correctly, what the paper suggested is that um, this entire premium, the difference that we saw in in growth of small versus large, is generated by a relatively small subset, I think it was 10, 15% of really high flyers, let's say among small companies. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this relatively small subset that are the high flyers that generate the, the, the extra returns. And if you are trying to select stocks, you're much more likely to miss them because this is a very small subset of 10, 15%. It's not that half the companies are flying high and generating, you know, it's a relatively small subset. So you need to own the entire asset class because if you don't, you are at great risk of not capturing these premiums uh, because you don't have uh, these, these high flyers. And, and of course we, we've looked at it and the professors have looked at it. Can you identify these and, and just kind of, you know, emphasize them more? There's no way to do that. Um, what you see is just that ultimately you need to capture the entire asset class. And that's what a comprehensive asset class fund would do, whether it's an index or uh, dimensional. Gotcha. I think the, um, let me, I was going to pull up a slide, but I will not do that. And we'll keep our, our discussion and talk technology. Listen, but I have seen that I, the, the point is, and I, I talk to clients about this, and we all do uh, here at WorthPoint, is you've got to have all those good companies in your portfolio and this idea of probabilities. Uh, what's the best way to do that? And you know, the research indicates that buying the whole basket, you're guaranteed, uh, you know, we don't like to say guaranteed, but if you buy the whole basket, That's you're right. most likely going to have uh, most of those companies in your portfolio while others may not. Very good. Um, so let's wrap up our conversation on safety before we move into opportunity. And thanks for that explanation, Apollo. Uh, our philosophy as a firm is really generally to pursue returns through equities and pursue, and pursue safety through bonds. Um, many investors think that a bond, you know, bond equals safety and are surprised when their bonds, maybe they're more volatile than they expected them to be. Um, I think worth pointing on the other hand, we found that not all bonds are created equally. And there are, in fact, some key metrics we can look at to help us mitigate the risk towards safety within a bond allocation in our portfolio. Namely, um, we look at uh, a lot of the research that, that uh, I, I'm sure you're familiar with uh, is global diversification, taking advantage of different yield curves around the world, uh, generally shorter duration or maybe uh, the better way to say it is duration appropriate, appropriately relative to the current yield curve. 
and higher investment quality. So those three points are what we look at. Um, why and how do the following risk strategies for le selecting bonds help reduce risk? I think the reason I'm bringing this up, I think there's a lot of folks out there who think, God, bonds aren't good right now, or maybe they are, and they're, they're a little confused. And, and with the yield curve doing it, what, it the, what it's been doing lately, maybe we can just kind of solidify these concepts in our investors' minds. Well, I think it's, um, it's a very good point that he raised. You can always get a higher interest rate on bond. There's no doubt in my mind. You can always find, if you're not happy with the 1% that the U.S. government, the 10-year bonds are giving you, absolutely you can go find one that pays you 5 10 even 15% uh, for the same time period. Uh, you just have to understand that that, that 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 comes at a much higher risk that that the the issuer might breach the contract uh, so there is a catch there and and the point that he made these bonds even if you go and you say I'm gonna go from the short term uh, high quality which are the US government bonds for short term and let's say I'm gonna go into long-term corporate if you look over the long run uh, what you see is that that the, it, the return improves instead of Three four percent, you make something about six percent per year, uh, and yet even at six percent per year, the growth of the same dollar again coming from that matrix book, the growth of the same dollar even in uh, long term corporate bonds uh, that carry certainly more risk than the short term government, um, they tend to go. Uh, it goes to about two hundred twenty five dollars in growth from a dollar, vastly different than seven thousand. So even if you go to these bonds, it's just, it just seems that you get more bang for the buck to saying my growth come from stocks. And, uh, and I think that's exactly what, what you're doing, uh, what Morgan is saying, which is it makes, it makes complete sense to me. Uh, even if you go to risk your bonds, you're not necessarily going to get paid in, enough to justify the additional risk. And there's one more thing. I mean, and that's something that you're going to talk is if you're looking for income in retirement, that's one way to look at it, uh, but there, you know, certainly other ways. And Morgan can tell you more about, you know, if you do need that steady income. I'm not sure that the high risk bonds are the best way to get it. Good, yeah, we do definitely talk to clients about total return um, exactly. when investing for uh, retirement and for trusts. So, good. Uh, th that was a good, some good feedback on this. Really, the three fundamentals we look at, but to make it more simple. Uh, the idea of taking your risk in equities and don't take that risk in bonds. And there was a way to diversify and uh, play, make those, that bond allocation relatively safer, safer by those three factors. Um, there's no indication that, that those strategies haven't broken down during this fundamental crisis. And, and when I say strategies, I'm talking about global diversification for the bonds, looking at a uh, yield curve uh, for duration on the bonds and uh, credit quality. <laughs>